Section 21 of The Theory of Moral Sentiments This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ariadna Solovyova Part 4 Of the Effect of Utility Upon the Sentiment of Approbation Consisting of One Section Chapter 1 Of the Beauty Which the Appearance of Utility Bestows Upon All Productions of Art and of the extensive influence of this species of beauty. That utility is one of the principal sources of beauty has been observed by everybody who has considered with any attention what constitutes the nature of beauty. The conveniency of a house gives pleasure to the spectator as well as its regularity, and he is as much hurt when he observes the contrary defect as when he sees the correspondent windows of different forms, or the door not placed exactly in the middle of the building. That the fitness of any system or machine to produce the end for which it was intended bestows a certain propriety and beauty upon the whole, and renders the very thought and contemplation of it agreeable, is so very obvious that nobody has overlooked it. The cause, too, why utility pleases has of late been assigned by an ingenious and agreeable philosopher, who joins the greatest depth of thought to the greatest elegance of expression, and possesses the singular and happy talent of treating the abstrusest subjects not only with the most perfect perspicuity, but with the most lively eloquence. The utility of any object, according to him, pleases the master by perpetually suggesting to him the pleasure or conveniency which it is fitted to promote. Every time he looks at it, he is put in mind of this pleasure, and the object in this manner becomes a source of perpetual satisfaction and enjoyment. The spectator enters by sympathy into the sentiments of the master, and necessarily views the object under the same agreeable aspect. When we visit the palaces of the great, we cannot help conceiving the satisfaction we should enjoy if we ourselves were the masters, and were possessed of so much artful and ingeniously contrived accommodation. A similar account is given why the appearance of inconveniency should render any object disagreeable, both to the owner and to the spectator. But that this fitness, this happy contrivance of any production of art, should often be more valued than the very end for which it was intended, and that the exact adjustment of the means for attaining any conveniency or pleasure should frequently be more regarded than that very conveniency or pleasure, in the attainment of which their whole merit would seem to consist, has not, so far as I know, been yet taken notice of by anybody. That this, however, is very frequently the case, may be observed in a thousand instances, both in the most frivolous and in the most important concerns of human life. When a person comes into his chamber, and finds the chairs all standing in the middle of the room, he is angry with his servant, and rather than see them continue in their disorder, perhaps takes the trouble himself to set them all in their places, with their backs to the wall. The whole propriety of this new situation arises from its superior conveniency in leaving the floor free and disengaged. To attain this conveniency, he voluntarily puts himself to more trouble than all he could have suffered from the want of it, since nothing was more easy than to have set himself down upon one of them, which is probably what he does when his labor is over. What he wanted, therefore, it seems, was not so much this conveniency as that arrangement of things which promotes it. Yet it is this conveniency which ultimately recommends that arrangement and bestows upon it the whole of its propriety and beauty. A watch in the same manner that falls behind above two minutes in a day is despised by one curious in watches. He sells it perhaps for a couple of guineas and purchases another at fifty, which will not lose above a minute in a fortnight. The sole use of watches, however, is to tell us what o'clock it is and to hinder us from breaking any engagement or suffering any other inconveniency by our ignorance in that particular point. 
but the person so nice with regard to this machine will not always be found either more scrupulously punctual than other men or more anxiously concerned upon any other account to know precisely what time of day it is what interests him is not so much the attainment of this piece of knowledge as the perfection of the machine which serves to attain it how many people ruin themselves by laying out money on trinkets of frivolous utility what pleases these lovers of toys is not so much the utility as the aptness of the machines which are fitted to promote it all their pockets are stuffed with little conveniencies they contrive new pockets unknown in the clothes of other people in order to carry a greater number they walk about loaded with a multitude of baubles in weight and sometimes in value not inferior to an ordinary juice box some of which may sometimes be of some little use but all of which might at all times be very well spared and of which the whole utility is certainly not worth the fatigue of bearing the burden nor is it only with regard to such frivolous objects that our conduct is influenced by this principle it is often the secret motive of the most serious and important pursuits of both private and public life the poor man's son whom heaven in its anger has visited with ambition when he begins to look around him admires the condition of the rich he finds the cottage of his father too small for his accommodation and fancies he should be lodged more at his ease in a palace he is displeased with being obliged to walk afoot or to endure the fatigue of riding on horseback he sees his superiors carried about in machines and imagines that in one of these he could travel with less inconveniency he feels himself naturally indolent and willing to serve himself with his own hands as little as possible and judges that a numerous retinue of servants would save him from a great deal of trouble he thinks if he had attained all these he would sit still contentedly and be quiet enjoying himself in the thought of the happiness and tranquillity of his situation he is enchanted with the distant idea of this felicity it appears in his fancy like the life of some superior rank of beings and in order to arrive at it he devotes himself forever to the pursuit of wealth and greatness to obtain the conveniences which these afford he submits in the first year nay in the first month of his application to more fatigue of body and more uneasiness of mind that he could have suffered through the whole of his life from the want of them he studies to distinguish himself in some laborious profession with the most unrelenting industry he labors day and night to acquire talents superior to all his competitors he endeavors next to bring these talents into public view and with equal assiduity solicits every opportunity of employment for this purpose he makes his court to all mankind he serves those whom he hates and is obsequious to those whom he despises through the whole of his life he pursues the idea of a certain artificial and elegant repose which he may never arrive at for which he sacrifices a real tranquillity that is at all times in his power and which if in the extremity of old age he should at last attain to it he will find to be in no respect preferable to that humble security and contentment which he had abandoned for it it is then in the last dregs of life his body wasted with toil and diseases his mind galled and ruffled by the memory of a thousand injuries and disappointments which he imagines he has met with from the injustice of his enemies or from the perfidy and ingratitude of his friends that he begins at last to find that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility no more adapted for procuring ease of body or tranquillity of mind than the tweezer cases of the lover of toys and like them too more troublesome to the person who carries them about with him than all the advantages they can afford him are commodious there is no other real difference between them except that the conveniences of the one are somewhat more observable than those of the other the palaces the gardens the equipage the retinue of the great are objects of which the obvious convenience strikes everybody they do not require that their masters should point out to us wherein consists their utility of our own accord we readily enter into it and by sympathy enjoy and thereby applaud the satisfaction which they are fitted to afford him but the curiosity of a toothpick of an ear picker of a machine for cutting the nails or any other trinket of the same kind is not so obvious 
their conveniency may perhaps be equally great but it is not so striking and we do not so readily enter into the satisfaction of the man who possesses them they are therefore less reasonable subjects of vanity than the magnificence of wealth and greatness and in this consists the sole advantage of these last they more effectually gratify that love of distinction so natural to man to one who was to live alone in a desolate island it might be a matter of doubt perhaps whether a palace or a collection of such small conveniences as are commonly contained in a tweezer case would contribute most to his happiness and enjoyment if he is to live in society indeed there can be no comparison because in this as in all other cases we constantly pay more regard to the sentiments of the spectator than to those of the person principally concerned and consider rather how his situation will appear to other people than how it will appear to himself if we examine however why the spectator distinguishes with such admiration the condition of the rich and the great we shall find that it is not so much upon account of the superior ease or pleasure which they are supposed to enjoy as of the numberless artificial and elegant contrivances for promoting this ease or pleasure he does not even imagine that they are really happier than other people but he imagines that they possess more means of happiness and it is the ingenious and artful adjustment of those means to the end for which they were intended that is the principal source of his admiration but in the languor of disease and the weariness of old age the pleasures of the vain and empty distinctions of greatness disappear to one in this situation they are no longer capable of recommending those toilsome pursuits in which they had formerly engaged him in his heart he curses ambition and vainly regrets the ease and the indolence of youth pleasures which are fled forever and which he has foolishly sacrificed for what when he has got it can afford him no real satisfaction in this miserable aspect does greatness appear to every man when reduced either by spleen or disease to observe with attention his own situation and to consider what it is that is really wanting to his happiness power and riches appear then to be what they are enormous and operose machines contrived to produce a few trifling conveniences to the body consisting of springs the most nice and delicate which must be kept in order with the most anxious attention and which in spite of all our care are ready every moment to burst into pieces and to crush in their ruins their unfortunate possessor they are immense fabrics which it requires the labor of a life to raise which threaten every moment to overwhelm the person that dwells in them and which while they stand though they may save him from some smaller inconveniences can protect him from none of the severe inclemencies of the season they keep off the summer shower not the winter storm but leave him always as much and sometimes more exposed than before to anxiety to fear and to sorrow to diseases to danger and to death but though this splenetic philosophy which in time of sickness or low spirits is familiar to every man thus entirely depreciates those great objects of human desire when in better health and in better humor we never fail to regard them under a more agreeable aspect our imagination which in pain and sorrow seems to be confined and cooped up within our own persons in times of ease and prosperity expands itself to everything around us we are then charmed with the beauty of that accommodation which reigns in the palaces and economy of the great and admire how everything is adapted to promote their ease to prevent their wants to gratify their wishes and to amuse and entertain their most frivolous desires if we consider the real satisfaction which all these things are capable of affording by itself and separated from the beauty of that arrangement which is fitted to promote it it will always appear in the highest degree contemptible and trifling but we rarely view it in this abstract and philosophical light we naturally confound it in our imagination with the order the regular and harmonious movement of the system the machine or economy by means of which it is produced the pleasures of wealth and greatness when considered in this complex view strike the imagination as something grand and beautiful and noble of which the attainment is well worth all the toil and anxiety which we are so apt to bestow upon it and it is well that nature imposes upon us in this manner it is this deception which rouses and keeps in continual motion the industry of mankind 
it is this which first prompted them to cultivate the ground to build houses to found cities and commonwealths and to invent and improve all the sciences and arts which ennoble and embellish human life which have entirely changed the whole face of the globe have turned the rude forests of nature into agreeable and fertile plains and made the trackless and barren ocean a new fund of subsistence and the great high road of communication to the different nations of the earth the earth by these labors of mankind has been obliged to redouble her natural fertility and to maintain a greater multitude of inhabitants it is to no purpose that the proud and unfeeling landlord views his extensive fields and without a thought for the wants of his brethren an imagination consumes himself the whole harvest that grows upon them the homely and vulgar proverb that the eye is larger than the belly never was more fully verified than with regard to him the capacity of his stomach bears no proportion to the immensity of his desires and will receive no more than that of the meanest peasant the rest he is obliged to distribute among those who prepare in the nicest manner that little which he himself makes use of among those who fit up the palace in which this little is to be consumed among those who provide and keep in order all the different baubles and trinkets which are employed in the economy of the greatness all of whom thus derive from his luxury and caprice that share of the necessaries of life which they would in vain have expected from his humanity or his justice the produce of the soil maintains at all times nearly that number of inhabitants which it is capable of maintaining the rich only select from the heap what is most precious and agreeable they consume little more than the poor and in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity though they mean only their own conveniency though the sole end which they propose from the labors of the thousands whom they employ be the gratification of their own vain and insatiable desires they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements they are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants and thus without intending it without knowing it advance the interest of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species when providence divided the earth among a few lordly masters it neither forgot nor abandoned those who seemed to have been left out in the partition these last two enjoy their share of all that it produces in what constitutes the real happiness of human life they are in no respect inferior to those who would seem so much above them in ease of body and peace of mind all the different ranks of life are nearly upon a level and the beggar who suns himself by the side of the highway possesses that security which kings are fighting for the same principle the same love of system the same regard to the beauty of order of art and contrivance frequently serves to recommend those institutions which tend to promote the public welfare when a patriot exerts himself for the improvement of any part of the public police his conduct does not always arise from pure sympathy with the happiness of those who are to reap the benefit of it it is not commonly from a fellow feeling with carriers and wagoners that a public-spirited man encourages the mending of high roads when the legislature establishes premiums and other encouragements to advance the linen or woolen manufacturers its conduct seldom proceeds from pure sympathy with the bearer or cheaper fine cloth and much less from that with the manufacturer or merchant the perfection of police the extension of trade and manufactures are noble and magnificent objects the contemplation of them pleases us and we are interested in whatever can tend to advance them they make part of the great system of government and the wheels of the political machine seem to move with more harmony and ease by means of them we take pleasure in beholding the perfection of so beautiful and grand a system and we are uneasy till we remove any obstruction that can in the least disturb or encumber the regularity of its motions all constitutions of government however are valued only in proportion as they tend to promote the happiness of those who live under them this is their sole use and end from a certain spirit of system however from a certain love of art and contrivance we sometimes seem to value the means more than the end and to be eager to promote the happiness of our fellow creatures rather from a view to perfect and improve a certain beautiful and orderly system 
than from any immediate sense or feeling of what they either suffer or enjoy. There have been men of the greatest public spirit who have shown themselves in other respects not very sensible to the feelings of humanity. And on the contrary, there have been men of the greatest humanity who seem to have been entirely devoid of public spirit. Every man may find in the circle of his acquaintance instances both of the one kind and the other. Who had ever less humanity or more public spirit than the celebrated legislator of Muscovy? The social and well-natured James I of Great Britain seems, on the contrary, to have had scarce any passion either for the glory or the interest of his country. Would you awaken the industry of the man who seems almost dead to ambition? It will often be to no purpose to describe to him the happiness of the rich and the great, to tell him that they are generally sheltered from the sun and the rain, that they are seldom hungry, that they are seldom cold, and that they are rarely exposed to weariness or to want of any kind. The most eloquent exhortation of this kind will have little effect upon him. If you would hope to succeed, you must describe to him the conveniency and arrangement of the different apartments in, in their palaces. You must explain to him the propriety of their equipages, and point out to him the number, the order, and the different offices of all their attendants. If anything is capable of making impression upon him, this will. Yet all these things tend only to keep off the sun and the rain, to save them from hunger and cold, from want and weariness. In the same manner, if you would implant public virtue in the breast of him who seems heedless of the interest of his country, it will often be to no purpose to tell him what superior advantages the subjects of a well-governed state enjoy, that they are better lodged, that they are better clothed, that they are better fed. These considerations will commonly make no great impression. You will be more likely to persuade if you describe the great system of public police which procures these advantages, if you explain the connections and dependencies of its several parts, their mutual subordination to one another, and their general subserviency to the happiness of the society, if you show how this system might be introduced into his own country, what it is that hinders it from taking place there at present, how those obstructions might be removed, and all the several wheels of the machine of government be made to move with more harmony and smoothness, without grating upon on one another, or mutually retarding one another's motions. It is scarce possible that a man should listen to a discourse of this kind, and not feel himself animated to some degree of public spirit. He will, at least for the moment, feel some desire to remove those obstructions, and to put into motion so beautiful and so orderly a machine. Nothing tends so much to promote public spirit as the study of politics, of the several systems of civil government, their advantages and disadvantages of the constitution of our own country, its situation and interest with regard to foreign nations, its commerce, its defense, its disadvantages it labors under, the dangers to which it may be exposed, how to remove the one and how to guard against the other. Upon this account, political disquisitions, if just and reasonable and practicable, are of all the works of speculation the most useful. Even the weakest and the worst of them are not altogether without their utility. They serve at least to animate the public passions of men, and rouse them to seek out the means of promoting the happiness of the society. End of section 21 Recorded by Ariadna Solovyova